You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 165, The Invasion of Norway, Part 3, Operation Vesser Urbung. This week, a big thank you goes out to Charlie for the donation, and to Michelle, Charlie, William, John, Anton, and Paul for choosing to become members of the podcast. You can find out more about becoming a member over at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. In September 1939, there were no real plans for how the German military would invade Norway. They simply did not exist because there were no intentions to launch such an operation. German leaders just believed that it was better for Norway to remain neutral. The protection provided for German civilian shipping by Norwegian territorial waters was actually pretty handy, and it made life easier for the Kriegsmarine because they did not have to worry about protecting any of that shipping from the actions of the Royal Navy. This mindset would begin to change during the last months of 1939 and into early 1940, as there was a growth in concerns about British and French efforts in Norway, as the tensions around Norwegian neutrality continued to increase. As late as January 1940, though, the German chief of staff Halder would write that, quote, It is in our best interest that Norway remains neutral. We must be prepared to change our view on this, however, should England threaten Norway's neutrality. The Führer has instructed Yodel to have a report made on the issue. The Altmark incident in mid February just amplified all of these German concerns and caused much greater urgency among the small group of German planners that were tasked with developing the plans for the invasion. The resulting plan would be uh, complicated, and it would be a great early example of a truly combined arms operation between land, air, and sea. This made the plan more complicated but was mandated by the geography of Norway, which almost mandated several amphibious operations if the Germans wanted to quickly assert control over the entire nation, a nation that was not well connected by rail or road. The push to do something to prevent a British and French violation of Norwegian neutrality came, first of all, from the Kriegsmarine. This was primarily driven by two different reasons, which were sort of opposite ends of the same coin. First of all, They did not want Royal Navy ships to be based out of Norwegian ports. This would enhance Britain's ability to control access in and out of the North Sea. On the flip side of that concern would be the ability of the Kriegsmarine to use those ports themselves. Extending German control into Norway would force the Royal Navy to patrol a much larger area of coastline when compared with the relatively small area of Germany that came into contact with the North Sea. While these positives and negatives were well known throughout the naval leadership, there was not consensus on whether or not breaking Norwegian neutrality was a good idea, and there were still many that believed that neutral Norway was the preferred option, while others believed the other. Really, a particular German naval leader's opinion on this really varied based on how important they felt Norwegian ports were to the tasks of the German navy, and how much those ports would help them achieve those tasks. Either way, the head of the German Navy, Raider, was very concerned about protecting the import of Swedish iron ore, out of concern that if less iron was available, the Navy would be the first armed service to see cuts in its allocation. It was due at least partially to this concern that the Operations Division of the Naval Staff would put together a report in October 1939 about what the best course of action would be for the Kriegsmarine, The report largely aligned with pre-war ideas. Germany should not do anything to break Norway's neutrality, but that such actions should be taken if the alternative was British occupation. When Raider presented this information to Hitler, he took a bit of a different approach throughout the report as he was presenting it. He played up concerns of British action as a way of trying to promote German action, German action that would be primarily driven 
by the Navy, bringing the German Navy into a greater spotlight. After the initial report by the Kriegsmarine was presented to Hitler, he then asked OKW to put some time into planning for possible action against Norway. This planning effort would be known as Study Nord, and it would present the first real detailed planning effort for the German invasion of Norway. OKW was an interesting place for this planning to happen because it was not the general staff of the army, but instead OKW, which many army leaders viewed as Hitler's personal military staff. Up until this point, most of the military planning had been done by the army, but an argument could be made that it was better for OKW to be doing this, kind of a a higher level organization, rather than a army organization, which the general staff was because it was, you know, under the German army. This Norwegian operation was almost certain to be a very combined arms kind of operation, and theoretically, OKW, with its central role, would be better positioned to do the planning. However, even if it was the logical choice, army leaders were not thrilled to not be involved directly in a planning effort. It would take a little over two months for a joint planning staff to be created in early February 1940. This staff was made up of one officer from each of the three services, along with officers from OKW, with the effort primarily being led by Captain Theodore Kronke, who was at the time the commanding officer of the German Deutschland-class cruiser Admiral Scheer. The planning group would meet for the first time on February 5th, and it was around this time that the operation would get its final name. Instead of Study Nord, which was felt to be a bit too obvious because it was literally just Study North, it would be called the Wesser Urbon, which in German means Wesser Exercise, with the Wesser being a river in Germany. The basic outline of the plan that was created by Kronke and his group would be roughly the same as the final plan, at least in basic structure and outline, although most of the details, or some of the details at least, would change. The plan involved the movement of troops to seven different Norwegian ports all at the same time. Oslo, Christiansland, Erindal, Stavanger, Bergen, Trondheim, and Narvik. If all of those areas could be captured by infantry troops landed by naval transport groups, then the Germans would quickly be in possession of most of Norway's population centers, industrial capabilities, and port facilities used by the Norwegian Navy. While the landings were occurring, Airborne troops would also begin dropping, with one wave occurring at the same time as the naval movements, while a second wave would land over the following days. After the initial wave of German ground troops were ashore, more would arrive on the fifth day, along with resupply operations, which would continue running while the ground forces advanced inland and north. The goal of these movements was to force Norwegian leaders to the negotiating table, with the German expectation being that these negotiations would start quite quickly due to the inability of the Norwegian armed forces to mount an effective resistance to German actions. A quick diplomatic agreement was preferred because it was likely that the Swedish iron ore traffic would be disrupted by the invasion, and if fighting continued for a lengthy period of time, iron ore traffic would be stopped for the duration of that fighting, and even longer, probably, as it would probably take time to re-establish the flow of goods from Sweden after the invasion occurred. One of the keys to the entire operation, and this would remain consistent throughout the entire planning period, was the fact that it was absolutely essential that secrecy be maintained as long as possible. Because of the nature of the geographic position of German naval forces, particularly transports, they would be very, very vulnerable to intervention by the Royal Navy until after the operation had already been launched. That's after the troops had been put ashore and the invasion had started. If the Royal Navy was able to intercept some of the invasion groups before that occurred, it was very likely that the invasion would be a failure. Therefore, secrecy was paramount. While the plan created for Vesa Ubung was at this point a pretty good outline, most of which would survive into the future, That was far from a fully detailed military operation plan, which would be required if it was to be put into action. The efforts to fully flush out the plan and make it ready for implementation were greatly expedited by the Altmark incident that we discussed a few episodes ago. The key reason that it would be expedited was the belief among German leaders and Hitler that the British would no longer respect Norwegian neutrality, which was not a bad read on the situation, as we discussed last episode. 
This meant that after February 19th, the planning for Vesa Ubung would go into overdrive, and for that to happen, a commander for the operation needed to be determined. The man that would be given the task was General Nicholas von Falkenhorst. Falkenhorst was really not a bad selection here. He was considered a mountain warfare expert, which made him familiar with operations over difficult terrain, which is exactly what his troops would find in Norway. Falkenhorst had also taken part in German operations in Finland during the Finnish War for Independence in 1918, during which the Germans had supported the Finnish Whites against the Finnish Reds during the fighting that occurred at that time. It was about as close as any German general would have to actual fighting experience in Scandinavia or in conditions like what would be found in Norway. Hitler would personally interview Falkenhorst before giving him the job. But whatever was said during this conversation was apparently to Hitler's liking because he would confirm his appointment the day after the conversation occurred on February 22nd. Falkenhorst would put together a staff and detailed planning would begin on February 26th. One important wrinkle to Falkenhorst's appointment was that he did not have direct command of any naval or air forces. He was an army general and he had command of the troops that would go ashore and he was the highest ranking officer for the operation, but he could really only ask that the naval and air force officers that he was working alongside do what he needed them to do. This would not be a major problem during the Norwegian operation, but it does point to some very clear conflict between the German armed forces, conflict that would only grow worse later in the war. When Falkenhorst and his team got to work, they immediately ran into some problems. The first problem was simple. Norway had been so far from the concerns of the German military that they had very few decent maps of the country. They had to fall back on things like travel guides and tourist brochures to fill in some of the details, never a perfectly reliable set of sources. When it came to the Norwegian military, there was also very scant information available. Now, none of this prevented planning. It just introduced a greater margin of error in many areas. While this was a military campaign as well, the directive given to Falkenhorst was that it should be carried out like a peaceful occupation as much as possible, because the German official position was that it was being done to support, not destroy, Norwegian neutrality. The forces involved were also to completely respect Swedish neutrality, a nation that would not be so lucky around the respecting of neutrality was Denmark which Falkenhorst believed must also be invaded and captured if there was any hope of the attack on Norway being successful. To invade and capture Denmark, Falkenhorst believed that two divisions were needed, which would be enough to capture the Jutland Peninsula and Copenhagen. Capturing these areas would give control of specific airfields to the Luftwaffe, which could then be used in the air operations that were involved with the Norwegian occupation. This was just one of many areas where Falkenhorst increased the forces required for the operation because the other forces were also increased due to Falkenhorst's concerns about how isolated many of the units would be after they landed. Falkenhorst was also concerned about Norwegian forces because even if they were not very numerous or strong or well-equipped, they had the advantage of knowing the terrain, of knowing the weather, of being in their home country. The final set of forces dedicated to the operation were over seven divisions of troops split between Denmark and Norway, including a whole host of specialty units of various kinds. However, even this number would increase in early March, mostly just to provide for more forces to achieve the goals of the operation faster and with less risk. Göring and the Luftwaffe would also have to be brought into the planning, and eventually the 10th Air Corps was created specifically for the operation. Falkenhorst plans were then presented to Hitler on February 29th, and they were approved. After the plans were drawn up and then refined in February, during March they moved slowly closer to implementation, not just due to further work on the plans themselves, which continued to occur and would continue to occur until the operation was launched, but also due to the growing fears in Germany that Britain was about to do something. This was driven both by the continued loud public support for Finland but also due to information gathered by German intelligence. This intelligence mostly involved some information about British efforts to convince the Norwegians to allow troops to transit their territory on their way to Finland, 
The entry for March 10th of the Kriegsmarine's War Diary would say, quote, The totality of the reports point in a compelling manner towards the possibility of immediate action by the Allies in Norway. End quote. There really was some evidence of the developing British and French plans, but there was also some amount of just pre-existing thought confirmation happening during the month of March. Raider was completely convinced that the British were planning to occupy areas of Norway, and that belief pre-existed any real evidence that it was about to take place. We of course know that Raider was completely correct, although there would be moments where such an invasion looked more or less likely, as we discussed last episode. But Raider was convinced that the British were going to do something even lacking exact specifics about what they were going to do, or even real concrete information that they were about to launch any kind of plan to invade Norway. And of course, they also did not know, the Germans did not know, that the British and French had a plan for when the Germans invaded, called R4, which was the plan that was put in place at the time that the British and French were planning to invade Norway in case the Germans got there first. For the Germans, though, the good news was that the plan that had been developed by Britain and France had some serious flaws that in many ways worked precisely in the Germans' favor. Because the major challenge for R4 was that it was totally reactive, and it did not have any provisions for how to change the course of the campaign once the Germans had invaded. It sought to put troops in certain areas and kind of just hoped that those troops would be enough to deal with whatever the Germans were planning, instead of really finding a way to disrupt German plans. And the German plan was very ripe for disruption because it required so much secrecy, because it was so dependent on, on stealth and surprise, any disruptions could have been catastrophic. Also, just in comparison to the number of troops that the Germans were committing to the operation, there simply were not enough British and French troops that were going to be put in Norway after the German invasion started. They simply underestimated the number of troops that would be required to answer a possible German operation, and they would pay for this mistake. But in general, the Germans did not know all of these exact specifics. They didn't know that the British and French response to any kind of invasion would have all these flaws. All they knew is that there were some pieces of evidence that the British and French were probably about to do something. And for Raider, that was enough, because he already thought they were going to do something. So any evidence that pointed in that direction just made him more certain. With the evolution of the plan out of the way, it's time to spend some more time digging into the exact details. And those details start with what was called Wesser Übung Süd, which translates into Wesser Exercise South, which was really the invasion of Denmark. The primary reason why the Germans needed to capture Denmark was due to airfields, specifically the airfields at Alberg on the northern end of the Jutland Peninsula. These were considered essential to provide the proper level of air support over southern Norway that the German army thought it needed. And so, the German army would invade Denmark, taking both the airports and the capital of Copenhagen. There were two main areas of attack. The first would be a series of airborne operations to drop paratroopers and then land infantry at the airfields that were the proper final destination of the attack. These troops would then be relieved by the ground forces that would enter Denmark from the south, with the bulk of the force being made up of the 170th and 198th Infantry Divisions, but the primary role in the attack would be played by the 11th Motorized Brigade and a collection of Panzer I and Panzer II tanks grouped under the 40th Panzer Detachment. Some of the motorized and armored troops would push ahead along the west coast of Denmark as quickly as they could. There would also be some tanks that would support the infantry advance further inland, and this included three Nebaifazoig B tanks. And this would be the only operation that they would take part in during the war. The Nebaifazoig tanks were heavy tanks, over four times as heavy as the Panzer ones, and armed with a 75mm and 37mm gun, which was a collection of firepower that dwarfed other German armored vehicles at this time. The reason that you may never have heard of this tank, and I'm guessing a good portion of you have never heard of it, is because there would be precisely five actually built 
and only three of them would see service in this Norwegian operation, where their performance would be less than amazing, and then they would never be used again. To meet the oncoming German attack, the Danish government had just two divisions, one to defend Jutland and one for Zealand. They'd only really started any kind of serious rearmament in 1937, and it would prove to be much too late for the small nation when faced with the resources of its much larger southern neighbor. Along with the forces that would be marching into Denmark, 8,850 men would be placed on board ships on their way to destinations in Norway. Their destinations would be the cities of Narvik, Trondheim, Bergen, and Christianland, and then the wireless stations at Egersund and Arendal. The vast majority of the first wave of troops attacking these objectives were carried aboard warships, generally destroyers and torpedo boats. Follow-up and reinforcement troops would be landed via merchant ships and troop transports, but the speed of the warships was essential to ensuring that the first wave arrived at their destinations on time. The German Navy would bring the troops to each destination with six separate task forces on their way to the six different destinations. The first to sail would be the task forces with the furthest to travel, with task forces 1 and 2 leaving together just after midnight on April 6th on their way to Narvik and Trondheim. Task force 1 would be on its way to Narvik with 2,000 men of the 139th Mountain Regiment spread around on 10 destroyers. Task force 2 would move on Trondheim with the heavy cruiser Admiral Hipper and four destroyers carrying 1,700 troops of the 138th Mountain Regiment. Task Forces 1 and 2 would also be escorted by the Gneisenau and the Scharnhorst on their way to their destination, but then the two German battleships would continue cruising north in an attempt to act as a distraction. Task Force 3 would not leave until a day after Task Forces 1 and 2, and it would be made up of two light cruisers, two torpedo boats, five motor torpedo boats, an artillery training ship, and a support ship. Their task was to land 1,900 men of the 159th Infantry Regiment at Bergen. Task Force 4 would have as its destination Christian Lind and Arendelle, with a landing force of 1,100, transported by the light cruiser Karlsruhe, three torpedo boats, seven motor torpedo boats, and an artillery training ship. Task Force 5 would be on its way to the Norwegian capital of Oslo, with the strongest naval contingent, consisting of the heavy cruisers Blücher and Lutzau, the light cruiser Emden, three torpedo boats, eight minesweepers, and two auxiliary ships. They would land 2,000 men of the 138th Mountain Regiment. Finally, Task Force 6 would be the smallest, consisting of just 150 soldiers that would be transported on four minesweepers on their way to the wireless station at Egersund, where the Norwegian terminus of the underwater cable to Britain was also found and was to be captured. Along with these naval task forces, Air Corps 10 would be used to assist in the attacks on several of the landing sites, particularly Oslo, Christianland, and Stavanger. 500 transports would bring parachute infantry and then would later just land additional infantry on captured airfields, with the goal of causing confusion and protecting the landing sites of the seaborne landings. These six naval task forces and then the 10th Air Corps would be the first wave of the attack, but it would only be the first and to support further waves of troops, there were several transport groups organized. Most of the follow-on transport was provided by merchant ships, which presented an interesting challenge due to their slow speed. It would simply take some of them quite a while to reach the more distant destinations like Narvik, and so they had to leave before the German military forces of the task forces departed. Seven merchant ships would make their way to Narvik, Trondheim, and Stavanger, although they would claim to be merchant ships on their way to Murmansk, if anybody wanted to know. These seven ships carried primarily heavy weapons, supplies, and equipment that the landing forces could then utilize after they arrived. The major follow-on transport was then done by three sea transport echelons. The first sea transport echelon, which was made up of 15 ships, would bring 3,700 troops and large amounts of supplies to Oslo, Christianland, Stavanger, and Bergen. The second sea transport echelon and its 11 merchant ships would transport almost 8,500 men of the 196th Infantry Division to Oslo, with the goal of reaching Oslo two days after the landings were complete. The third sea transport echelon would bring its 12 merchant ships and over 6,000 troops into Oslo six days after the first troops arrived. 
Altogether, the naval contingent of the operation represented almost the entire operational strength of the Kriegsmarine and a serious commitment of German merchant ships. I ran through all of those troop groupings because I wanted to give you some kind of idea of the overall complexity that the Germans were dealing with here. The fact that the operation would go off without a major problem, well, at least mostly, is pretty impressive. It was a very complicated plan that involved coordination between forces on land, sea, and air, but the detail and thoroughness of the planning was top-notch. It would then be carried off with a bold execution in a sense of purpose, with a few bits of good luck thrown in for good measure, something that most large successful plans have to have at some point to be truly successful. There were some problems with the plan, though, and the inability of Germany's enemies to capitalize on those weaknesses is kind of the story of the early war years. The three main problems, in no particular order, were that it did not plan for the future occupation. There was a lack of unified command of the operation, and it depended entirely on surprise to be successful. All three of these could have caused problems, but they were only problems that the enemy made them problems. The occupation was only at risk if the Norwegians, British, and French could stage a successful defensive campaign. The unity of command could only be pressured if the enemy forced the German leaders around Norway to start making hasty and stressful decisions. And the dependence on surprise was only a problem if intelligence efforts on the other side managed to succeed in determining that an attack was about to happen early enough to react. There would be instances in which some of these things happened, and the brittleness of the German plan would be exposed, particularly at Narvik, where resistance would be far greater than expected. And then there would also be a pretty strong response at Narvik. But in general, none of these possible problems would be pressed by the enemy, and so they did not become real problems. The plans for the operation were approved on the afternoon of April 1st, with all the senior officers involved with the operation present in a meeting with Hitler where the approval was obtained. Falkenhorst would write of this meeting that, quote, he cross-examined every man who had to explain very precisely the nature of his task. He even discussed with the ship commanders whether they would land their men on the right or the left side of a given objective. He left nothing to chance. It was his idea, it was his plan, it was his war, end quote. The plan was for the landings to take place on the early morning of April 9th, which was during a week of favorable conditions with April 15th being seen as the last viable day due to the shortness of the Northern Lights, which were a major part of enabling some of the nighttime operations. On April 2nd, after the final approval for the operation had been received, the official war diary of the German naval staff would read, quote, With the order of the Führer, Wesserebrung has been initiated, commencing one of the boldest operations in the history of modern warfare. Its implementation has become necessary in order to defend vital German interests and supply of raw materials, which the enemy is attempting to sever. The outcome of the venture will, to a large degree, depend on the quality and readiness of the naval forces, as well as the determination of the individual officers in command. The landing operation will predominantly take place in an area where England, rather than Germany, has naval supremacy. Surprising the enemy is important for success, and will depend on the extent to which, in the coming days, secrecy can be maintained." End quote. West Rebrung was on its way to happening, but before any German troops landed on Norwegian soil, there would be a naval confrontation in the North Sea, which we will cover next episode. 